Vuestra presencia en este meeting y mi presencia en esta tribuna debe mostrar claramente a esos cabrones de la burguesía y del gobierno que la PNT y la FAI son fuerzas que aumentan con la represión y son más solidarias en la burguesía. Anarquistas. Welcome to the Anarchism.info podcast. Uh, who are you and um, what is your interest in anarchism in general and also like as an ideology and as a subject of research? Okay, who am I? That's that's a tough one. So I, I work at Loughborough University and I've worked at Loughborough University uh, since 1992. And I was hired as a uh, historian of ideas to teach the uh, the mainstream canon, I guess, uh, Machiavelli to Marx. And I would I came into academia um, partly because I couldn't think of, of anything else I really wanted to do apart from continue with with the with the sort of the student life or the, the postgraduate life that I'd been I'd been living. And um, I came to anarchism as a student. So I was introduced to it uh, when I was an undergraduate at Queen Mary College, which is in London. And um, I did a history politics degree. And uh, one of the courses I did in my second year was on uh, the Spanish Civil War. And it was in the course of, of, of studying that that I, I heard for the first time about this revolution <laughs> and these anarchists. And um, I was absolutely uh, gripped by it. And uh, the the um one of the one of the pieces of work i was i was set to do was um it used the the quote on the the vernon richards book um i'm going to get it the wrong way around now but the you know the the rebels armed won the revolution and the the arming of the the, the creation of the army as he says it neater than that but the creation of the army lost the war and um the more i read about anarchism and the experiences of of the the anarchists in spain the more convinced i was that that, that was true and my next encounter, I suppose, with anarchism was was the year after that, and I did a um, a course that was loosely called political theory, but it was it was basically a study, an anarchist critique of revolution um, from the French to the to the Russian Revolution, and that was the first time that I came across the the writing of of Kropotkin and Bakunin and um, Rudolf Rocker, the person who taught me, William Fishman, was a a great admirer of Rudolf Rocker and a friend of Fermin Rocker, who was Rocker's son. And that and that sort of sealed my um, my political interest, I guess. I mean, I I I I hadn't really thought of myself as as any kind of um, any particular sort of variety of socialist. I guess I, I thought of myself as being on the left, and I thought of myself as socialist. And and anarchism just resonated with me. And I was lucky enough to be able to. Um, to get a funding to to do a um, a postgraduate degree, and and I did that on on Kropotkin, and um, that's how it started. And I, I've not really looked back. I suppose um, it's that's where I've kind of sat my whole uh, academic career. Kropotkin is rather well researched. Is that true? He is well researched, and. Um, I guess at the time that I started looking at Kropotkin, he was less well researched. Although, I mean, um, the Martin Miller book uh, was available. Caroline Calm's book came out just about the point I finished my um, my postgrad research. And but I mean, Kropotkin was always in the sort of the the literature that I was looking at. Kropotkin was always represented represented as the the friendly anarchist, the sort of the approachable anarchist, and he was the sort of um, the foil to Bakunin, the the crazy, destructive, um, irrational, romantic force. And part of what I wanted to do was to challenge that uh, that presentation and to to rethink Kropotkin as someone who was actually much closer to. Um, 
to, to, to dissolve some of those boundaries, if you like, and to, to question the extent to which, you, you know, the, the simplicity of, of, of having this good and evil um, take on anarchism. And I wanted to, to think about how, the, how his work spoke to, to, to continuities about uh, revolutionary change. So although the presentation might have been different and although Kropotkin engaged differently, I think, with, with, um, with the audiences that he wrote for, um, it seemed to me that there was a consistent message that, that ran through uh, late 19th century anarchism, and that was one of the things I was interested in showing. There's been a recent move as well to like re rehabilitate Kropotkin in a way and make him a bit more palatable to to like a, a general audience within a sort of general liberal democracy. I think that's true, and I think a lot of that comes from the. I think what people fasten on in particular is is the idea that Kropotkin is a scientist. So Kropotkin, particularly the sort of the the Kropotkin of mutual aid. So the work he starts to do in the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, which culminates, I guess, in the publication of Mutual Aid, that Kropotkin uh, makes an intervention into, uh, into social Darwinism, uh, that he's a, you know, he's, he comes from an academic background, uh, he's a scholar, he engages in the sort of the, the science of his day, um, all of these sorts of ideas which... Um, it's not that they're they're not true, but I think they tend to to use science in a rather um, uncritical way. And I think actually, when Kropotkin engaged with science, he used it in a particular way, which was quite critical and which um, was more imaginative than than the the conception that tends to get um, read into the, the concept now. I looked a bit at at um, the Anarchist Studies project and. One of the articles in, I think, Glass, uh, the issue before the, the newest one, uh, asked the question of, that a lot of anarchist research is uh, focused on like the 18th century anarchists, the classical anarchist period. And how does that connect like to where social movements are at today? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I suppose I, sh you know, I should declare my own um, interest, which comes from looking at the history. So I started as a as a historian of the of ideas, and um, although I, I I stray into contemporary thought, um, I'm still. I mean, my first love is is in the history of 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 the anarchist movement. So you know, I look at I'm you know I get excited about looking at um, old archive material and old newspapers and and trying to make sense of of what it was the anarchists were trying to do and the forces that they were up against and all the rest of it. But I mean, as a, um, I would defend that as, as, as sort of a, a really important part of, of anarchism um, research, if you like, because, because of the distortions uh, and the misrepresentations of, of anarchism by, uh, in the mainstream, if you like. So I wouldn't say that uh, the history is 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 the only thing that 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 should be done. It's certainly not the only thing that is done. It's it's just a sort of a preference, I guess, um, that I have. But I don't think. I mean, it seems to me that that movements um, learn from their pasts. Uh, that that they can. I mean, like you know, they can be inspired by what they read. They can. Uh, correct some of the misrepresentations. They can um, give themselves different ways or equip themselves with different ways of thinking. You know, you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. There is a tradition there, and that tradition is not to be sort of preserved in aspic. Uh, but it seems to me that it's a it's a really valuable resource uh, for everybody. I can I can really relate to that myself as well because when you've been involved in on in organizing um, a while, I often get the feeling that you relive some moments that you can also read from in history. That's right, and and I think um, in, I mean one of the things that that comes across quite strongly in the in the history is the is the resilience of of these um, of the anarchists. You know, in spite of everything that they faced, and in spite of the 
uh, you know, the ridicule that was heaped upon them, and in spite of the difficulties that they uh, that they confronted in in terms of organising, and you know how they dealt with that, and the different strategies they adopted, and and just the richness and the diversity of of anarchist thought. You know, it's it as I say, it seems to me that that's something that uh, that 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 that. Uh, you know, existing um, activists can tap into and adapt and learn from and uh, and use for their own um, their own um, activities and practices. But it can also feel a bit daunting, I think, because like when you look back at history and you see uh, like the classical anarchist period and and the large social movement around it. Um, it can almost feel like we're uh, we've never had that kind of moment again. It was a, a grand start and, and then it sort of faded out. Uh, what do you think about that? <laughs> I, I think, I mean, there's, there's, there's obviously some, um, there's obviously something in that, uh, you know, the, the, the 20th century, you know, there were movements, you know, the, 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 the Spanish CNT, the, the, the anarchist union boasted a million members, uh, you know, there were, there were, there were mass movements, but at the same time, um, if you read, you know the letters that 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 activists were sending to each other they were often very um despondent and you know they were you know giving support to each other to to hang in there and 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 not get depressed by their by what they perceived as their lack of progress um and i think you know it's 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 worth remembering that it's a bit like you know if you read emma goldman's you know was my life worth living uh, it's a reflection on on what she uh, admits, if you like, with her the disappointments of her life, and and in the end, you know, the conclusion that she comes to is that, you know, we can't we can't measure, um, or we can't use conventional measures of failure and success in order to to chart the uh, the uh, the importance or to, to 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 estimate the importance of anarchism or to to think about its its purchase in the world. And I think that's really interesting. Like one one aspect of that is some of the ideas that are presented within anarchism or that get developed within anarchism are also entering the mainstream discourse, sort of incognito or unrecognized. That's true, and and I think you know recently one of the things that was became apparent in the in the the pandemic was the the currency of mutual aid. Uh, which was used. I mean, it became a you know, it's become a an established kind of uh, term in in discourse, and and it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to an anarchist as it does to to a non-anarchist. Um, I mean, it seems to me that it's it's a really um, positive thing that mutual aid is out there as a as a concept, and that people latch onto it, and they they have you know, it has various connotations and associations. Because it, it gives anarchists a an entry point to then say, well, look, you know, if there's if there's some some overlaps that we have, if there is some some shared um, endeavours that we can um, pursue because we we have this term in common, then you know, let's unpack it and see, you know, what would sustain it from an anarchist point of view and and what it might require. You know, it opens a conversation, if you like, a dialogue that that is otherwise shut. Uh, usually to anarchists, because there's still this prevailing view that that anarchy is chaos and that, you know, anarchists are uh, just sort of protesters. They have nothing to constructively to contribute to politics. You know, those those um, those gaps they're, they're for me, they're sort of points of intervention or possible intervention. Right. And there's also like a message within the method uh, sort of that is uh, could be communicated and and uh, hopefully um, erase some thoughts that might otherwise not have arisen. That's right. So, you know, so it's possible. I mean, you know, you can speak to different audiences and it seems to me that that we should be speaking to different audiences. Uh, we should be speaking to to people who don't think of themselves as anarchists as well as people who do, um, because that's the way that, that the ideas gain, you know, great attraction. And uh, you know, to sort of say, you know, do you do you understand that, or do you un are you aware of the history of mutual aid? Are you aware of the uh, the ways in which uh, people like Kropotkin elaborated it and the and the, the social implications of it, uh, and uh, you know, the economic implications of it, the ethical implications of it. You know, and how far how far would you want to uh, challenge your existing arrangements in order to pursue mutual aid as a 
as a you know as a, um, as a principle in social life. I wanted to ask you a bit more about like um, the relationship between uh, anarchism as an ideology and scientific research, and I wanted to ask you what what the significance of anarchism within scientific research uh, could be said to be. I know that's a very broad and, and general question, but maybe in in the fields that you're involved with in particular. Hmm. That's that's a it, it's a hard question, I think. Um... So how does research speak to um, to the ideology? I mean, I think, I mean, it can speak in different ways. So, so one of the things that research gives you is a uh, is time to you know to publish, uh, to to think and to read and to write, and um, so it it is a sort of um, you know it's an incredibly sort of privileged position. The difficulty of of research, or one of the difficulties of research, is that uh, the kind of the condition or the deal that that certainly within any institutional, I mean, scholarly kind of you know university framework, I should say. I mean, there's plenty of research that goes on outside of universities, but within the university framework, the expectation is that you have to address a particular kind of audience in a particular kind of way. But I mean, given that, it seems to me that one of the things that's happened in the last I don't know, 20 years, 30 years maybe, uh, is that there is an increasing body of of work out there, not just in politics, uh, but in geography and anthropology and cultural studies in, in, in a, you know, a range of sort of cognate fields, uh, which are inspired by or which examine uh, anarchist thought. So it puts anarchism on the map, if you like. So I think um there is much greater awareness now uh about and appreciation uh of anarchism as a as a body of thought and as a a way of thinking about politics than there had been previously whereas you know i think when i started the 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 general trend was to think of anarchism as a movement that had had its time it was past it had gone um so I think that that's part of what it can do. I think the other thing that that, that research, I mean, more generally, um, why it's important and, and why it happens uh, both within universities and outside, typically, I mean, you know, um, anarchist researchers were, were outside of universities, is that it, it allows people to, to enter a dialogue with each other. So, you know, um, through research, you can raise questions, um look at problems uh debate differences you know that's that's just all part and parcel of of being part of a movement uh and thinking about you know what those movements uh or how those movements are constituted and what they can do and and what their aims might be um and then i think there are sort of there are other ways of thinking about research in terms of the um the ways in which it allows uh, researchers to to write to different audiences. So uh, again, I think that comes back partly to the time that certainly that 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 universities give. I mean, they provide a platform and enable connections and networks to be to be made uh, to be forged, um, which allow researchers to talk to to different audiences, not just those who who you know consume the academic journals, but hopefully also those who are. Um, really uh, central to the to the movements and the um, the practices. I guess also like within within that framework, uh, it's possible to develop critiques and ideas that might not be be possible to develop directly within social movements. Um, because like it's it's a different situation when you're in the nit and grit of trying to get something done, whereas when you can sit back and and reflect in in a, a more uh, isolated or or set a, a setting that's more set aside, so to say. Yeah, I agree, but I think also you know one of the things that that research allows is reflection and learning. So, um, I mean, I like to I like to to think that at least some research you know looks works with and and uh cultivates relationships with people who are involved in that kind of you know the day to day the uh you know the the important practical um efforts 
if you like. Um, and there's a there's a way in which you know research can can uh, learn from and amplify uh, what's going on in order then to to share it, disseminate it, allow people to engage with it. And and you know at least some of the work that I've done um, has has tried to do that. Do you have like examples of of that kind of uh, interchange, or uh, more specifically, how? a body of research can uh, filter into or um, enrich um, active social movements? Sure. So, I mean, one of the one of the projects that I've been in, you know, there's a big project that I've been involved in with um, Alex Pritchard, who's at Exeter University, uh, and Thomas Swan, who was also at Loughborough University until recently. Um, in, sort of it, it, it arose from a discussion that Alex and I had had about 19th century anarchist theory um so he's he's an expert on on proudhon and i'm interested in kropotkin and we came to the conclusion that there was a um i mean strange to say but a constitutional tradition within anarchism so um what's one of the things that proudhon and kropotkin were trying to do was to think about how anarchists describe themselves how they how they formulated their arrangements how they uh develop their societies and and this is this is what constituting means to put yourself or to name yourself as a group and to think about the rules that you're going to to develop uh, the the practices that the institutions that you're going to organize and and all of these sorts of things and and if you look at any kind of anarchist or anarchistic moment i mean say i mean one of the things we looked at was the occupy movement or three of the camps within the occupy movement and what those camps did was to constitute themselves in particular ways. And um, so what we did was to, to try and use this idea of constitutionalizing to think about how those practices work. And rather than theorize it in the abstract, uh, we turned precisely to not just to the experience of Occupy, but also to uh, we looked at the IWW and we looked at a cooperative, an anarchist cooperative movement in the UK called Radical Roots. And we worked with members of Radical Roots. We co-produced with Radical Roots um, in order to think about some of the what we could think of as the uh, the strengths and weaknesses of of, of anarchist constitutionalising. So it was a bit more than just uh, we wanted to use constitutionalising rather than organising, um, because organising didn't seem to have the same kind of um, depth to it, I guess. Uh, and and we put together a a couple of guidebooks which are coming out um, soon with with PM Press, um, precisely to to try and encourage people to think about how the, the this this um, I don't want to say knowledge, but this sort of reflection, if you like, on on anarchist constitutionalizing in reality in the real world could help other people uh, scrutinize critically their own arrangements and and uh, identify the, their own you know the, the strengths and weaknesses in their own practices. And um, okay, so that's coming out in in a short while. Yes, should be should be the beginning of next year. I think, uh, like spontaneously, um, I think some people would also see a bit of a contradiction in in the idea of constitutionalizing uh, anarchism. Yeah. Um, so the key difference, <laughs> I mean, they, they certainly would. And 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 again, you, you know, you can, you don't have to, you know, you just need to scratch the surface of of um, of uh, historical anarchism to find that that there's a um, you know a very strong current of anti-constitutional thought in it but the, the difference or the, the distinction we're trying to make is between um, movements that constitute themselves without trying to impose single authorities which are flexible and which are uh, fluid if you like so the distinction between that kind of constitutional practice and the the you know the liberal republican the constitutional practice we're all con, you know sort of familiar with in the state which basically starts off with the idea that you have to have the authority and it's the authority the permanent fixed authority which then outlines the rules sets up the institutions and everybody else has to fit in with it mm. so that one is built from the bottom up the other it comes top down I think one one idea about uh, the kind of republican constitution that I think is really fascinating. I think one of the the best examples of it is uh, the electoral college in the in the United States is the controlling aspect of it that that you have a sort of idealistic or or utopian 
influence in theory, yep. but then it's always channeled through the authority in order to uh, remain in control from economical or political elites. That's right. And and I think I think the word utopian is absolutely perfect um, in that sense, you know, that it's uh, that that kind of arrangement points to a um, a view that suggests that that we can that human beings can kind of devise perfect political orders and those those orders can be encapsulated in constitutions that have to be preserved at all costs come what may you know and despite the uh, the recognition of their flaws of their systematic abuses their you know their power relations the asymmetries of those power relations and all the rest of it so so anarchist constitutionalizing is it works in, in completely the opposite way but it recognizes that people do formulate rules they do um organize themselves uh they do try and institutionalize their principles uh, but they don't try and impose those they don't try and sort of protect them forever they try and make them flexible to to changes in attitude belief and norm Right, because uh, rules in general, I think, can be used as a tool to to achieve the goals that you need to achieve as a movement. Uh, but but that is within a certain context, and and of course, when circumstances change or when you achieve certain goals, then then the rules might not be the right tool anymore, and you need to constitute something else or something new. Precisely, precisely. Um... But if you if you think that the rules don't, I mean, I think that the, the one of the the points we were trying to make was that um, denying the existence of the rules can also be disempowering because you know rules can be unwritten and they can be unspoken uh, and they can you know we still sort of tailor our our behaviours <laughs> to unwritten rules and and so being aware of the fact that when you constitute yourself, you are, you know, that action comes with a certain baggage. I mean, that's, it's just a way of trying to make yourself aware of the, um, of the constraints that you're agreeing to and those that, that are perhaps uh, more, you know, less positive. Mm. But there you can also see like um, a potential for, for reciprocity when, when you read a work like the one that you're uh, going to present, as uh, organized or as uh, part of uh, a constitutional uh, movement or group, then you can also learn from that and and uh, try to implement it. And that, of course, creates something new, which would also be interesting to study uh, yeah. or to compare with the results that you already had with. Yeah, I hope so. And, and, and one of the things that, you know, um... Yeah, I mean, one of the things. I mean, it's it's a it's a never-ending project. I mean, it's it's one of the things that that, that came out of of the of the process. I I suppose was hearing from other people about or other groups how they'd used the uh, the pamphlets and and what they'd taken from them. And uh, so we're not trying to say, you know, this is a sort of single shot silver bullet, um, you know, way to uh, to practice. Uh, anarchy or to you know to arrange your affairs but it's a as i say it's just kind of a, a dialogue it opens up a discussion another aspect that i also wanted to ask you about is um if there is research that is more oriented or specifically like anarchist research that is more uh, oriented towards proposing ideas that are um are not um developed within movements but rather within uh, philosophy or academia um um yes well i suppose i mean there's a whole branch of 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 thought which is which is conceptual and i suppose is designed or intended to to think about um or explore the yeah anarchist core beliefs and the relationships between ideas so for example, um, you know what an anarchist might uh, mean by liberty, and how that might differ from from a non-anarchist view, or or what it means to be communist. Um, I mean, some of these. I think some of this work is really important. I mean, particularly because of the 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 history, if you like, of socialism, where you know some of the some of the differences, some of the overlaps, some of the the, the and the uh, yeah. I mean the, the the stark sort of disagreements, if you like, between uh, anarchist and non-anarchist socialists 
um, have have resulted in um, you know movement disintegration and and animosity uh, and violence. I mean, you know, these sort of trying to clarify what how you you're cl- trying to clarify some of the concepts and ideas. I think is is important work. But again, I don't think it's. I, I think the intention of that work is is also um, discursive. I mean, and has to be discursive with anarchism that you're never going to be able to to fix these things, you know, settle them forever. There's never going to be a, a con- you know, a, a sort of a a uniformity in 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 that work. But I think it's important work. But uh, maybe that also holds a bit more through to uh, true to uh, like what what social research is, uh, because like. A, a vulgar view of science and and uh, one view that is often presented within like um, the kind of online discourses that we're often familiar with is where you have like the natural science perspective which is uh, extrapolated or or put on all research and and where social research is meeting the same expectations but not living up to it because because it's always within this discourse discursive framework that's right and i think so in a sense i think that for me that comes back to uh to the ways in which anarchists like kropotkin challenged uh challenged conventional views of what of what science is and 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 his argument was that science was not this practice or endeavor that kind of floated above everything else science was interpretive uh just like just like any other activity was and and science was a tool uh, that could be employed um, and was employed. It was employed by by non-anarchists all the time to promote or to to present their ideas as inevitable, essential, um, necessary, and all the rest of it. That there were no alternatives because science told you this. And and what Kropotkin did was say, no, science is is all about you know deciding. Uh, it's a tool which allows us to. Uh, to realise um, goals and um, ideas that we consider valuable, that's what it's there for, and and there's nothing that that is. Uh, he wasn't trying to use science, if you like, as a as a way of discovering truths or uh, presenting phenomena as as fact. What he was trying to do was to to look at the world and say, you know, a scientist understands. Uh, the natural world as a set of fluid relations, and and that's the starting point, uh, you know, which en- enables us then to think about, you know, how we want to to arrange our affairs in in ways that are, you know, scientific. That is in keeping with that kind of fluidity and malleability. It sounds like um, that would be sort of useful and accessible to modern researchers, whereas like a lot of con- Kropotkin's contemporaries might have uh, had an ideal of science as a more rigid fixed system yeah i think that's right and i think uh, you know a lot of um i think a lot of uh, you know that that tends to be the dif- the default in you know in um in our own times you know that that science is something that that other people do in order to tell us you know how things are going to be and science is the you know gives us the cures to things science gives us the facts science science is somehow neutral um you know i don't think kropotkin believed any of those things hmm. um I, that's really fascinating because like i've heard discussions about um maybe a lot of the classical anarchist uh, thinkers having been very um oriented in a modernist framework that might not be uh so useful today but uh but what you're saying is uh, really contradicting that so i think it's true that they you know they come i mean certainly people like um kropotkin and bakunin and you know all of these people i mean that you know they they come from a particular you know um what's the, i mean they come from a particular mood. They're, they're people of their time of course they're people of their time so they come with certain predispositions and and ways of understanding the world but i think I mean, Kropotkin makes this quite explicit that, you know, that you can't have science that reflects 
the the ways in which knowledge is constructed in only one part of the world. So, you know, if we're going to have scientific exchange, we have to understand that different people in different parts of the world see that world in different ways. Um, and that's the exchange that we need to have, uh, not the imposition of one worldview on everybody else. Mm. And, and that's, that's explicit in Kropotkin. Um, can you like um, read an explicit critique of uh, science being used as part of the imperialist project? Well, I mean, I suppose when you, if you think about it, I mean, the, the critique comes in his understanding of economics, which is also presented. I mean, that's you know, so economics when it's treated as a science is for for him absolutely an instrument of uh of domination because it it's based on the premise of a of a of a, of a global division of labor um, which privileges uh the imperial over the colonial hmm. over the colonized sorry i should say of course that's also something you can can often recognize um how economy or the economic studies or sciences are being used today as well in in uh, contemporary discourse Exactly, and and it's and it's so when it's when it's construed as this science that runs on its own uh, principles and logic, which only economists can properly understand, and the rest of us are kind of kept out of. That's that's for for him the the construction of a science, and and that construction in itself is marginalising. It excludes people, uh, and it's used typically in order to perpetuate relations of domination. Hmm. It sort of reminds me as well of like similar systems. Uh, social democracy can uh, can work in a similar way as well, where you have this kind of rigid system of answers that that uh, you can always refer to and that are almost uh, falling back on circular reasoning yep. in order to justify themselves. Yeah, and 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 the whole idea. I mean, that's I suppose that's another aspect of of 19th century thought, however sort of um, constrained it may have been, or it was, um, was that, I mean, that the, the anarchists, I mean, almost, uh, I mean, not uniformly, but I would say typically, I mean, that the, the you know, the sort of the, the dominant view within 19th century anarchism was to, to reject the thesis of progression, the kind of the civilization narrative. Um, which again they saw as as being, you know, utterly bankrupt and 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 simply a tool of of uh, of the colonizer. So I mean, you'll find that in in people like Louise Michel, you'll find it in Reclus, you'll find it in Kropotkin, you find it, you know, in 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 any number of of anarchist writers. They simply deny the thesis of progression that uh, that that prevailed in in the, you know the liberal mindset. Hmm. Um, would one example of that be how Kropotkin in, in uh, I think in Mutual Aid, it was several years since I read it, but but um, where it talks about the medieval uh, commune um, and as an example of maybe a more liberatory framework in certain aspects. Yeah, so I mean, a Mutual Aid, I mean, I think is quite complex in the way that that, uh, that the anarchist, that he puts the anarchist thesis, because on, I mean, the first few chapters, I mean, the first one starts off with with um, his, the kind of the the critique of, I mean, it's it's about, you know, Mutual Aid amongst animals, I and mean, that's that's the, the starting point. And then he talks, uh, he uses the language of, of, uh, of kind of Victorian liberalism, which is to talk about savage and barbarian societies, and and the language is is clearly jarring. But what he says about about so-called savage and barbarian societies is that actually they they organise themselves in through mutual aid. They establish systems of of um, of or principles of community that are enduring, um, and that. The, the destruction of those institutions, uh, village communities and so forth, is, is regressive. So, so although he uses uh, the, the, you know, the conventional language, if you like, the discourse, he turns it on its head in terms of his assessment of, of, of the achievements of, of so-called uncivilized peoples. 
who would be regarded, um, you know, pretty much as 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 subhuman from the from the, the colonizer's viewpoint. And then when it gets on to when it gets on to the city state, I think the argument is that not that although the, the city states flourish in Europe, I think his argument is is not that Europeans somehow did something that non-Europeans were unable to do, but but simply that this was a conscious um, model uh, for mutual aid, uh, which could be um, adapted within a European context, not that it was a model for um, for the rest of the world. I mean, you know, I think there are problems with with the arguments of mutual aid, but I certainly don't think it speaks to a you know, a, a, a civilizer's view, a civilization narrative. Mm. And naturally, of course, there has been a lot of research being done since since Kropotkin wrote Mutual Aid as well, which he couldn't have known um, that maybe would would uh, put things in another light and so on. Also, yeah, I think so. And 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 as I say, I think you know the the hope is that 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 research would come from from multiple sources uh and have different perspectives and you know enrich uh the study that he was doing from his location um because it would be written from from multiple locations hmm. but speaking about that um maybe i can ask like are there what what are the pitfalls or problems with working with the 19th century thinkers and uh studying them today um, well, I suppose that you know, the I, I suppose the problem that I've, I've found most often is that you know I spend such a lot of time um, reading this work that you go and you get stuck in the bubble, you know, that you you start to, uh, you get so close to it that that it's it's useful to be reminded that you need to get distance, you know, and and particularly when if you're if you basically wants to defend against against the attacks that it's you know that anarchism is a theoretical uh, that it's a political you know all of these kinds of of conventional critiques you know if you if you're trying to defend against that it's 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 easy to get uh, sucked in a bit close um, and particularly when you're trying all the time to to put yourself in the you know you're trying to work out the way in which someone was seeing the world and and trying to interpret that um yeah so uh, it's it's good to 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 come out step outside sometime and and uh, look at it at a distance hmm i wanted to i was a bit curious as well like are there um as a researcher are there uh, risks involved in in choosing anarchism as a field of study yeah i think there are i mean I, you know i i accept the you know the, the the general critique that um studying anarchism can turn it into a um can reify it it can turn it into a you know a, an object um it can distract from the movements that are going on i mean you know i accept i accept that those risks i think that they're bridgeable and i think I th I think there is there is still some purpose in keeping anarchism on the table, if you like. I think we lose something if we if we don't contest the the misrepresentations. I I, I think that's a loss. I think that's and that's something that um, that should be done. Mm, yeah, uh, naturally, I I agree with you on that point. Um, I, I wanted to follow up one thing you said, and that is uh, that you are uh, often involved in defending anarchism for being a theoretical. And um, could you explain a bit more about what what is meant with theory in that case, and uh, how you would respond in in such a situation? So uh, um, I think there are. For me, there are there are two main sort of strands of that. One is the idea that that anarchy itself is uh, is the mirror image of order. So anarchy is chaos to the to the order that the state brings. So it's an impossible it's an impossible condition, and it's a threat. So it's it's, it's two things at once. So one defence is to say. You know, your you know is to is to try and unpack that construction and to try and challenge that construction, um, and that's still you know the starting point for 
for for mainstream political theory at European political theory. The other strand of it is is the argument that's you know that was put I mean even by people like Daniel Garin that anarchism is a is a practice rather than and it made no anarchists made no independent contribution to socialism. So socialism was really defined by Marx. That's you know he's the leading philosopher. That's the leading theory. And the anarchists were people who interpreted that theory in a libertarian fashion. And and my view is that uh, that that's uh, that's misleading. Um, and I think the anarchists, or at least there is a, a current of thought within anarchism that was perhaps overly hostile towards Marxism, but that was uh, that was. Uh, that wanted to, to to challenge the ways in which socialism had been defined by Marxists, uh, and I think that's also worth rescuing and 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 thinking about. Mm. Because I think that that critique often is also brought to the table by Marxists in particular, and and trying to say that well, nothing within anarchism is comparable to the theoretical framework that that Marxism presents. That's right, and uh, I just don't think that that's correct. Uh, you know, I think anarchism, you know, gives us a, a whole set of 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 tools that that not only, um, you know, challenge the ways in which uh, Marxists understand historical change, the ways in which Marxists present class, you know, all sorts of things, you know, that. The, the the priority that 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 Marxism tends to give to to problems of production to you know broadly speaking economics as opposed to mm. to, to cultural and uh, and other forms of other phenomena which which have their own uh, associated oppressions so you know there's a there's a whole wealth of of theoretical tools within anarchism that I think are um, are really important. I think we could talk about that for a very um, a long time. Um, <laughs> uh, we already talked a bit about like if um, research can can help. Uh, I don't. I think that question is uh, answered sufficiently. So maybe we're approaching an hour for the interview. Uh, so I wanted to start to wrap things up a bit. Okay. But I wanted to ask, like, what do you see in the future of anarchist studies and and research? Um, so I think one of the things that I think one of the things that that enriches research is this, you know, this uh, openness and this willingness to to see where the affinities lie. So what is it that anarchism can, or how is it that we can enter into some kinds of dialogues with new movements um so like indigenous people's movements or uh movements like black lives uh how is it that we can think about anarchism from non-european perspectives you know what would that mean um i think those kinds of you know where where do the where do those alliances lie i think that's one thing and but i i, I think also um alongside that that what, how can we use the critical tools uh, to to look at the uh, the mess we're in, <laughs> you know? um, and to to help people think about what they might be able to 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 change uh, in lives which are otherwise you know subject to so many sort of complex forces that it's that it becomes disempowering. So you know how do you how can you organise? Um, enduring movements that are going to tackle, you know, climate crises and, you know, all of these things that we know about, um, you know, systematic exploitation, you know, the, the, the forces that are active uh, in the world that are, that are driving migration and, and all of the violence that, that, that meets those who are trying to, uh, to escape from you know impoverished conditions that are that are not of their own making i mean they're the critical tools um which i think we need to to keep honing mm. i think that's also like one one uh, aspect where the left in general is still missing a lot of tools and answers when it comes to how to uh, in a in a um, um sort of more palatable or more understandable way to 
connect these different problems and and uh, how they are challenging people and where where uh, people in the rich countries might see their little piece and where it's hard to develop um, strong bonds of solidarity between groups that where the ruling classes are trying to uh, sow division, so to say. Yeah. I think that's right. But, um, you know, I think there are signs of hope. I mean, you know, there there are sort of trends towards devolving power in, in liberal democracies. There are trends towards, um, you know, grassroots act activity towards sort of more um, self-government, if you like. I mean, these are all entry points. I mean, you know, clearly they're not anarchist in the way that, that they're, they're, they're currently framed. But I think, you know, they're the things that you can tap into uh, in order to try and change those um, those entrenchments of power that are, 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 as you say, otherwise so divisive. I wanted to ask a bit about like the, the Anarchist Studies project. Can you uh, tell us a bit more about that? The journal? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the journal started, um, well, we're coming up to an anniversary, I think. Um, it started as a as a um a project that came out of a group called the history workshop which is a a sort of a an academic or a scholarly group it, that 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 was active in or it's still active but it was it became very active in the 60s and 70s and um a group of people within the history workshop thought of themselves as anarchists and decided that they wanted to um to set up a um a newsletter that's how it started and um, I think it was 1993 uh, that a journal, uh, a publisher was found for, a, it became a journal. And um, just by chance, actually, I mean, I, I registered my interest in that. I mean, I was I was um, told about it by a colleague of mine at, at Loughborough, Dave Berry. And um, and so I got involved um, as part of the, of the editorial board. And... Um, I've been the I've I was I took I became the editor. Um, just trying to think when now. Sometime it must have been about you know, fifteen years ago. And now I'm co-editor with a, another colleague of mine at, at Loughborough, Matt Adams. And uh, we do two issues a year. We um, we publish uh, anarchist research in pretty much um, any field. I mean, it tends to be largely arts and humanities. Um, and, and that's where our, I suppose, our, our expertise really lies. But we publish it in, you know, geography, arts, literature, history, politics, contemporary theory. Um, so it's a it's a multi and interdisciplinary journal. It's yeah, it has diverse perspectives. It doesn't have a um, a programmatic outlook, and it just tries to to get the ideas out there. Uh, what does it mean that it doesn't have a programmatic outlook? So we don't have we don't. Um, we don't have a line, <laughs> you know. We we allow people to express to say what they like about anarchism, and that that's it. Doesn't it? Doesn't um, we? We don't try and impose a, a particular perspective. Mm. But but uh, surely you draw the line somewhere between like what what is and isn't anarchism in that uh, regard. So um, we do sometimes get contributions from people who I suppose would be put as uh, right libertarians or anarcho-capitalists and um, you know the the stock response to that is you know if you want if you want to defend if you want to defend a view then you have to engage with the with, with the literature that objects to it and if you can do that then that's fine um, and so far we haven't uh, no one's sort of really hit that bar <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if someone raises to the challenge now. <laughs> no, but um, uh, if someone would be interested to to like get into research with an anarchism, uh, how would they go about it? So I suppose the first thing would be, I mean, if if you're not familiar with the journal, then there's a there's a web page, Anarchist Studies. It's published by Lawrence and Vizart, um, and you can um, there are a number of free to view articles that are available there uh, so you can see what kinds of things are published you also see um, you know you'll get the contents page and and see the range of stuff that's that's published and then you know um, Matt and I are, are very happy 
for people to write to us and with ideas for things that they want to write about. Um, and, we, and, you know, we can take the, we can take it from there. Okay, thank you very much. I think it will be uh, very interesting for people to to uh, hear this, and I think it might be surprising for a few also that uh, like that there is um, a lively scientific community around anarchism. Uh, I don't necessarily know if that's um, general knowledge. So thank you very much for sharing that, and uh, thank you for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, is there anything you would like to add before we end the discussion? No, I, th I think, um, yeah, we've covered a lot of ground and, um, yeah, it's been, I've really enjoyed it. Vuestra presencia en este meeting y mi presencia en esta tribuna de demostrar claramente